Okay, chapter 10 of the ACE 6th edition personal trainer certification uh, textbook. And chapter 10 is on assessments, muscular training assessments. Remember chapter nine started on the muscular system and chapter 10, again, a, um, another significantly long chapter that's gonna be on assessments. This is a very important, uh, very important chapter, particularly from a testing perspective. Remember, remember paper, um, note-taking paper, whether that be lined paper or whatever, um, um, or just straight like I have here, which is just, um, just copy paper with a writing implement. Remember, read, write, recite. Your goal, uh, remember, particularly now in chapter 10, is to, you got, you got a fair amount of memorization you have, uh, you have in front of you because assessments um, assessments are important to understand when it comes to not only how to how to actually do them, but um, how to interpret them. So that's really what chapter 10 is going to going to go over. But uh, we have functional assessments, movement assessments, load speed assessments. And uh, right off the bat, it's a really good idea to, to take a step back first and read on page 399, the apply what you know box. The idea here is that just like everything else, what ACE wants you to keep in mind is that you uh, you have to keep a client-centered approach to uh, how to use the assessments and in your, in your initial exercise um, session. So just keep in mind that when it's client-centered, it simply means we're doing what personal trainers do, which is personal training. It's a personal issue. If a person doesn't want to do different assessments and they just want to train, um, you know, okay, that's fine. If you don't want to do assessments, if we don't want to do any of these, uh, uh, any of the pre-participation screenings, uh, dynamic assessments, people don't feel comfortable, then as far as ACE is concerned, and as far as I've always been concerned, we don't have to do them. Uh, and we definitely don't want to make people feel uncomfortable, especially right from the get-go. And so, when you read through this, it's client-centered. Um, client's goals, remember, client goals and attributes should dictate, and I'm just reading this to you. You can read it yourself, but I'm giving you this preliminary information because as you're going through, you're going to question the efficacy of some of these assessments. We all do. Um, not everybody is going to, is going to want to... Um, want to participate in all these different assessments. Um, most folks that you're going to train could benefit from pretty much all of these assessments. And when you get to the end of the chapter where it's more, um, I would say more sports related, sports related type of assessments, those individuals that are in good condition that can do it, you can do some of those assessments as well. It's always based, it's always based on the client. It's unnecessary, this is another good point, it's unnecessary for the first training session to consist exclusively of assessments. I'll give you a, a perfect example of that. When clients sign up for your services, um, they understand for the most part that you're gonna do some basic assessments with them in the, first, in the first time they come to see you, especially if you tell them that. But I, I'll tell you this, most people, they wanna work out. When clients come and they pay for your services, they want to work out. They want to train, even if it's just a little bit. So the recommendation is, and that's what Ace is saying, the recommendation is that, look, just because it's the first workout, you don't have to get all these assessments in and do your screenings and testing and all this other stuff. And then, hey, have a great day. I'll see you, you know, see you next time. No, it's normally a good idea. And again, it's been my experience that I'll do assessments, but you're working out today too. We're getting, we're getting a training session in, we're gonna start the exercising process and you get them, kind of get them motivated and excited to exercise and train. And then you can, um, in subsequent workouts, you can then bring in more assessments. It's not the end of the world if you, if you don't get all of these assessments and all of these, all these tests in um, right off the bat. It's just not necessary, why? Because not everybody is interested um, in doing these assessments, um, number one. And the second one is like I say, people want to actually train. Um, clients will often opt out of doing these as well. 
And so that's what they're saying. You may uh, simply move forward with your actual training program and you're using your best guess. Um, and you can, you know, you can select exercises and intensities uh, based on, again, your best guess of what the individual is, is um, bringing to the table, so to speak. Um, and you should be able to um, observe a client's movement proficiency improving over time. So basically what ACE is saying is, is that, look, if a client doesn't want to do all this stuff, you still as the trainer, you have still have to figure out ways to somehow or another assess progression and, and the client um, actually making um, gains in certain, certain variables that you have to uh, look at subjectively. And so whenever we can get objective data, we want to get objective data. But if you can't get objective data, then you got to do you know, you got to be more subjective, obviously. And those are the things that you would explain uh, to your client. The idea then is that as long as you're getting data, whether it be objective, which is ideal, or subjective, it's still client-centered. By the way, I've, I've trained um, so many individuals. For the most part, I never have and have very seldom had any issues getting assessments done right from the get-go. A lot of that is based on your initial report development process, the way you actually start the conversation with individuals. I'm not your doctor. However, we do need to collect some baseline data. And these are some of the assessments that we go through. Um, and for the most part, don't have an issue. But yes, there have always been clients who are like, I don't want you to take my body fat, or I don't want to do that test, or I'm really scared of doing a push, not a problem. Don't worry about it. You want to know what ends up happening is that as time goes on, I might throw in, Hey, by the way, you know, how about we try doing a little push up assessment? Let's try one of those because now you're using a, you know, a pretty significant amount of weight in your bench press. Let's try a sub max, a sub max strength test. We can even do a, uh, a, a, a one rep max on the squat. Why not? And I, you know, I'm just telling you that you can, uh, you can actually encourage and motivate clients after a time you've been training them to actually now want to do those assessments. Remember, this is not a clinical, it's not a clinical laboratory setting. We're looking at what the client's goals are and we're moving forward with that. That is your preliminary introduction to chapter 10. This is um, it's probably one of the most important chapters um, in, the, in the textbook. So you got to keep your, keep your wits about you when you're going through this. Take your time. Remember, uh, just like on all the other chapters, particularly the longer ones, stop this video as you need to, to spend more time studying and looking through the particular mirror, uh, materials you may, be, you may be having challenges with. So um, initially, let me just go ahead and kind of give you a rundown. There's three main groupings of assessments, like I said. There's functional assessments, and there's going to be static postural. And the reason I'm going through this with you is I want to make sure you, you write these. This is what I would do. Okay, I'd write, I would take this, and I would write down functional assessments and give one separate page for each one of these functional assessments static postural assessment. I'll give it one page. Static balance unipedal um, stance test. Okay. Uni, that's the one leg, one leg stance test, right? And I would put that, I would give that its own. And I would do that for all of these. Now, what some people will do, and I've, I've seen it uh, a lot of times, is some folks will simply put these on their flashcards. So memorizing the general, the general assessments. And the same thing with movement assessments. I would do the same thing. Um, bend and lift assessment. And the reason you're doing this is because you want to give total focus to each particular assessment. What happens is that as you're going through the chapter, it can get confusing. You can get bogged down with the different information um, involved in each of these. I will, I'll, I'm just going to tell you right now, these are not difficult, uh, difficult assessments to memorize, know, and understand. Remember, 
You got to memorize material, but you really want to know. Not, I'm not saying that you're going to ever do the McGill's uh, testing battery for for um, for for trunk movement and and proficiency. I'm not saying you will ever use the I don't know, you know, the muscular endurance assessments. Can't see why you wouldn't do it, but or the dynamic balance, the wide. I'm not saying you'll ever use those, but I'm going to tell you right now that you really want to know, and they're not difficult. They're not difficult to learn and memorize. So I'm giving you a lot of preliminary encouragement, so to speak, before we start the chapter. So you don't get frustrated and you don't get lost in the weeds. Take each one of them. That's the strategy is take each one of them and spend some time looking at them. There's a lot of intuitive common sense to, to every single one of these assessments. Remember this functional assessments, there's movement assessments where you're actually doing a movement and you're watching your client from the side, from the front, from the rear, and you're taking notes. Um, and there's load and speed, um, speed assessments, okay? So remember, if you think back to what the IFT uh, model is, the integrated fitness training model is, it's gonna, start to, it's gonna start to make sense. Remember, there's the functional, the movement, and the load speed phases and that's basically what we're what we're uh, doing here to assess um, those three those three uh, levels in the muscular training in the muscular training model so first off are the functional assessments static postural assessments the key here with pad uh, static postural assessments is basically you're you're having a client stand there you try to by the way and and they'll tell you this is that if you tell your client, I'm going to do a stat, I'm going to do a postural assessment. I want you to get, no, you're going, they're going to put themselves in an unnatural position. One of the things I always used to do when I would do postural assessments is I would tell my client, look, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a real quick assessment. Just want you to stand, face me. I'm going to watch you from the side. And they would immediately do this. And then what I would do, I knew that would happen. So immediately what I would do I just start talking to them. I'd say, so how was your day? This and that. And what would happen is as, is as a client is like this, and as they start talking to you, oh yeah, well, they would start to go into their normal position. And that normal, quote, normal position for them is what I was looking for. And for the most part, I'm not sure I've ever met a client or an athlete alike, maybe occasionally, that did not have some sort of postural deviation or dysfunction. It, it's just kind of the nature of the beast with the average with the average person who sits down all day and at the computer, you can see all of this. So I would spend a fair amount of time in this one in particular uh, because it does help to appreciate what happens to to normal um, to the normal curvature of the spine, normal tilting of the pelvis, those things. And that's why table uh, ten point one to ten point four, are just are just unnecessary. They are necessary to memorize. It's not a lot to memorize. I'll give you an example. So, uh, muscle imbalances associated with lordosis posture. And on page three ninety four, you've got these main uh, postural deviations. They call them. And when we talk about deviations, we're talking about these um, these no, quote normal. Although they are deviations, they're not normal, but they are things we see all the time. So for me, I'm always thinking this is a normal deviation for somebody that sits all the time, right? They become kyphotic and they have this anterior tilting or posterior tilting the pelvis. But here are your postural deviations. Um, you just quickly memorize those. They're not that difficult to, uh, to look at. Keep an eye on the arrows, okay? That's how you memorize this. Uh, focus on the arrows and you can start to see pelvis and spine. Pelvis and spine, those are your main areas. And then of course, you'll, you'll notice that there is uh, knee issues, but, but you know, think about this. Anytime you move or, or have a deviation from what would be considered ideal posture, um, you're going to have movement of these different areas of the spinal column, the head will move forward. For instance, um, the knees will move forward or backward, whatever the case is. But normally that's due to the pelvis anteriorly posterior tilting. 
and the way the spinal column, because you have these normal, you have a normal kyphotic, normal lordotic curve in the spinal column, and those will deviate uh, for whatever reason. Not interested in that yet. You're just interested in looking and writing this down. So table 10, one, if a person has lordotic posture, and you can see that in figure 10, three, just first off, you just take a look. Remember, that's what we're looking at. Each one of these tables is directed towards one of these pictures. So if you look at that first picture, uh, we definitely see that the hip flexors are probably tight. The term is um, facilitated, hypertonic, overactive. Um, and the muscles that are lengthening because they're not, they're not pulling the way, they're not applying enough tension the way they should, they are underactive, right, or inhibited. Those would obviously be the, uh, the antagonistic muscles to the ones you just saw on the facilitated. So if the hip flexors are tight, then the hip extensors are probably lengthened and, and underactive. Now you can see why if you memorize muscles, basic muscles in the, in the hips and the pelvis, if you memorize those and you know their kinesiological function, i.e. extension, flexion, um, right? Pronation, supination. If you memorize those over and over, right? Do it. It just becomes natural. You sit, you, you just look at this and you go, oh, the hip flexors, that's right. The iliopsoas and the, and the abdominals or the pectineus or the iliacus or whatever the case is. Now I roll those off, off my tongue pretty easily because I've been doing this for 30 years. So you do it every day, it becomes relatively simple. You wanna be able to memorize it, just, you know, pretty much memorize it, you do it day in, day out, it'll make sense. And you'll memorize them. Table two, um, kyphosis posture. Watch, look at the arrows. If you look at the arrows and you come down and you can see anterior chest and shoulders, okay, latissimus dorsi and the neck extensors, look at the arrows, okay? If you look at the arrows, it starts to make sense because all you got to do is start doing those, start doing these positions yourself. And, and you'll notice that when you do it, you're going to see how these muscles are are either overactive or underactive. So table 10-2, uh, again, table 10-3, um, And so now you get into muscle imbalance and postural deviations. Go ahead and just uh, rewrite those, um, those bullet points for correctable factors and non-correctable factors. One of the things we know is that scoliosis, you know, one, two, three, four, the fifth picture over here on the right side, you ain't doing anything for scoliosis, to be honest with you. Um, so just don't even, it is what it is. You can help, you can help from a, from a muscular perspective to help you know, the client get stronger in certain ways, but that is not, that is a lateral deviation off of, off of neutral when you're looking at the um, spinal column from the, from the back or the, or even the front. So, um, those are your non-excess, uh, non-correctable factors. Now, as we move into uh, the, your protocol and your observations for the static postural assessment, again, there's a fair amount of normal deviation that occurs. You don't want to get into the weeds when it comes to looking for these little minor deviations that you're looking for gross gross deviations or imbalances. That's kind of the idea. You're looking for these gross, and this is what uh, figure 10-4 gives you. This is not difficult. It doesn't take much time to do this. Your goal is to look, assess, and then write it down. And I will, I can move you actually forward to, ACE is actually giving you, if you go to page 407, you can look at the postural assessment checklist, as well as um, the, uh, anterior posterior worksheet and they give you they actually give you these sheets that that you can use so i'm just showing you ahead now we get into the common postural deviations themselves and um and you got to memorize these so deviation number one you'd write that down subtalar pronation supination and um and here's where you'll get you'll get all screwed up um the subtalar joint the foot itself, when you start 
It's a, it's a remarkable mechanical structure, it really is. So from the foot itself has something like 30 something joints just in the foot and the subtalar joint, they call it the, um, they call it the steering wheel called um, in some circles, the steering wheel of the body. In other words, because of that joint, that subtalar joint where the calcaneus um, <clears throat> meets the other, um, the other bones in, in the top of the foot, um, that joint allows for stability and manipulation. In other words, the foot, if you look at the foot, pretend my hand is the foot, the foot can move in many different ways, right? It can dorsiflex, right? This is my heel. Let's see if I can do this. This is my heel and these are my toes. It can dorsiflex, right? Toes up to the knees. It can plantar flex, point the toes down. It can also, it can also turn pronation supination. That's what that's called. It can also invert, right? That's my pinky toe. That's my big toe. It can invert or inversion or evert, meaning that my, that my big toes can turn in this way. When you, um, and that's a combination, inversion and eversion is actually a combination of twisting and rotational, it actually torsions and moves the knee and the pelvis. There's a lot that goes into it, but don't, don't, uh, you know, don't throw in the towel yet. Um, basically what's happening is that, is that at the subtalar joint, you can see some of these deviations. So subtalar joint pronation, supination, and the effect on the foot. Basically what they're saying is that um, if you look at somebody, you can actually check to see what's going on at the subtalar joint simply by the way their knees are turning in and the way the femur, the upper leg bone is turning, turning in or rotating. That's what that apply what you know part is. So deviation number one um, is basically telling you that this is what it should look like versus what this, what the deviation is. And then what that tells you about um, this particular uh, client situation. So basically remember now, starting from the bottom, we have, we have looking at the uh, main joints of the body. So we start at the feet. And we're basically looking at the ankle. Deviation number two is we, we work our way up. By the way, it's not that we're not looking at the knee. It's that that joint at the foot is what's causing this deviation at the knee normally. Deviation number two is you're looking at the hips themselves. And if you can look in figure 10.6 on page 399, basically when the hips themselves raise on one side and, and lower on the other or one or the other, we call that um, hip adduction. It's not the easiest thing to see. One of the reasons why we ask our clients to wear a relatively tight clothing is so that we can see some of those, some of those deviations um, the tables that go along with them are just going to be summaries and help you to um, take all of that written information, puts it right into a chart for you. Remember, write it down. It's not that difficult observation. Um, if you see the right hip lifting up or the left hip lifting up, then that's, um, that's going to tell you something about, uh, something about the position, um, position of the hip. So table 10, six, really simple really straightforward. Deviation number three is the, now remember, that adduction is looking at them from the front, so it's in the frontal plane. But when you look at, when you look at the pelvis from the side, you can see whether it's twisting, or excuse me, tilting forward or backward. And we're talking about from the superior aspect of the, um, <clears throat> of the pelvis, uh, superior um, spinal process of the, of the iliac spine. So, from the side or the sagittal, the sagittal movement, sagittal plane movement is going to have either anterior tilting or posterior tilting, right? The butt tuck is posterior tilting because we're, we're looking at it from the context of the top. And um, that's what you're going to see. So, so uh, deviation number three is uh, posterior or anterior tilting of the, uh, of the pelvis. And again, that's going to tell you something about overactive, underactive, hypertonic, hypotonic, muscles that are involved uh, with that. Deviation number four is shoulder position and the thoracic spine. So now we're into the scapula positioning. Scapula has six main associated movements, um, movement of the scapula up, down, um, out, in, and rotating this way and that way, 
right? And those are those names are given right here. So elevation, depression, um, um, abduction when the scapula move away from the spine, um, adduction when the scapula move closer to the spine, um, upward or outward rotation, and then back down would be um, uh, would be internal or downward downward rotation. And that's movement of the scapula. So again, you're looking for those potential deviations. And that's basically what you're getting in this entire front part of the front part of the chapter. Now, um, deviation number five is going to be the head. This is a really good indicator of what's going on, uh, particularly in the thorax and the and the cervical, cervical um, spinal column itself. So head position. Now, again, this is just, again, if you look at somebody from the side, the ideal position is that the, is that the straight line goes down through just roughly by the earlobe behind the earlobe, straight down through um, the shoulder. You can see in this picture on, on table 10-9, head position figure 10-17 on page 406, you can see that the head is jutted forward. If you, if you go back to page 394, look what you're looking at. It could be an issue of sway back. It can be an issue of flat back. Um, you can even, eh, to a certain extent, it could be a kyphotic issue, but you don't know um, by just the head position. That's why it's one of the five deviations. So again, keep that in mind, postural assessment checklist and worksheet. You can, you can look at those. They're great to have. They really are. And the little picture of the of the uh, of the person there gives you the ability to kind of circle or mark. And that's something you can look at. You can even show it to your client if you're going to if you're going to use it. Um, the static balance test. The idea here. And I'm not going to go through and read everything for you. I do want you to understand some basic things about each of these tests. <clears throat> In the static balance, you can do it. The idea is to do it both ways, with the eyes open and then with the eyes closed, because really, with the eyes closed, you're really testing um, the vestibular the vestibular system. Because remember, part of part of balance is being able to cue visually cue the environment. As soon as I close my eyes, I don't have those cues any longer. Now I've got to use these internal cues that the vestibular system and the proprioceptive system in my body, around my joints, and everything else. Um, affords me. As soon as I open my eyes, I get a cue that helps me. It's kind of like, think about when you, um, when you go on a boat and you get seasick. If you go out and you tend to get seasick, one of the reasons is because you have no cueing about you. But as soon as, and I'm telling you this because this happens to me, but as soon as I get into, come into shore and I see land and it gives me a solid view of something that's not moving, I got a visual cue, I don't get seasick. It's the same thing. I mean, for the most part, same, same system. So uh, static balance, a unipedal stance test is going to, um, it's going to basically help you understand where an individual is at when it comes to basic balance. Of course, you're going to read through the test protocol and administration. Just keep in mind when you're doing these to, um, to appropriately prep your prep your client and explain to them, this is how it's going to work. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. We're going to do this, this, and this, um, and then go ahead and administer the test. It's going to be like that with each, each one of these. Once again, this is a good one to do. I'm not sure why you wouldn't do this with any client. The next one, the Y balance test is going to be a little bit more you know, for individuals that perhaps are a little bit more athletic and perhaps in better condition, you got to be really, really careful. Trust me, you'd be surprised if people try to do the Y balance test. And one of the reasons is because you're literally having somebody put their foot on a slider or like a, a furniture slide or something like that. So their so their forward foot that's moving can slide. You'd be surprised. Uh, you would be really surprised. Uh, some people can not have really good balance and they put their foot on this slider and they, right? So uh, just keep in mind that when you do the Y balance test, you are really clear, um, really clear that this client actually can balance and maintain uh, the dynamic balance as they're doing this uh, test. And basically all they're doing is one foot is planted flat 
The other foot is on, is on the slider that allows them easy movement on the floor. They come forward pretty much as far as they can comfortably. They come back, they step off to the side and they come back. And then they take that leg and they go back behind the, the leg that's, that's there without bending the knees. Kind of the idea is that there's some twisting and torsional movements. You're trying to keep, try and keep um, uh, a straight, straight torso position with little to no movement of the hips while you do it. It's actually, it's actually a good test um, for dynamic balance. And um, ironically enough, you can actually use that, not that Ace is gonna tell you to do it, but just as an aside, you can actually use that as a, as a training, as a training tool. <clears throat> you can, I've done it, I've done it any number of times where I use it as a training tool using resistance, holding things, doing unilateral. And again, it's with athletes. One of the reasons why, even though it's here, how often you're going to use it, you know, I don't know. But on page uh, 412, there's your, there's your little diagram. It's just, again, put down all the way forward, back, one side, back, back and front. And then you do it with the next leg. And then there's your scoring sheet, uh, the McGill's. Corso muscular endurance, muscular endurance. It's for muscular endurance. That's what the McGill's torso test is, um, test battery. It's three tests, it's checking the muscle endurance of the anterior, the lateral and the, and the extensor components of the, um, of the core midsection. Trunk flexor endurance is basically, um, basically seeing how long an individual can, and you can see by the way on page 415, um, the, um, the amount of time, length of time that a person can stay in, in this position where they are roughly at 60 degrees, right? Their torso 60 degrees, um, in hip flexion, this, uh, this picture gives you a perfect, uh, a perfect example. What we do, you get the person into position, hold the bench up for them, and then you pull the bench back and they hold themselves. Um, just read through what the, what the protocol and administration is in, in the real world. It's easy to administer. You pull the bench away and you look and you're timing it, right? And you're just timing and you're watching. Any, any time you see deviations and like they start to go forward, this or that, the test is over. That's the time you put down. Real simple, but it's a, it's a battery. So it's three tests. So you do one, and then you say, great, come on over here. And we're gonna do the uh, lateral endurance test. And when you go to page, 416, you can see that the uh, the trunk lateral endurance is basically you're having them on their side. And if you look at the first part of the figure, they get into the position, arms at the side, and bam, they hold it. Remember, this is an isometric, it's isometric. Once you start seeing uh, adverse movement, the arm goes down, that this happens, the torso twist, that's done. You're done. Okay. You could do it, of course, with the knees on, uh, with the knees down. That's the modified version. And then finally, we have in the McGill's test, we have the trunk extensor test. And this is basically, you know, again, if you don't have if you don't have this uh, this ability, like we see here in Figure Ten Thirty, if you don't have this apparatus, the setup, you got to go with Figure Ten Thirty One, which is just the modified version. Again, if you can do it, your goal is to have the individual get up into this position. It's an isometric contraction and it's testing the endurance of the erector spinae, the gluteus max, all of those, what we call the posterior, posterior chain uh, muscles. And now you're gonna simply uh, mark down how long they did it. You're going to be able to now develop what we call the, uh, the uh, ratio patterning between flexors and extensors and <clears throat> uh, right side and left side bridge ratios. Okay. This helps you to understand muscle balancing. Can't, you know, I can't express how strong and strongly important it is, particularly with athletes. Not that we, not that I would use this test a whole lot, but when, when we train athletes, we need to know muscle balancing so that they don't injure themselves because generally they're working at very high levels of muscular output. And for the most part, what we see is uh, in track, in the track and field sports, the field sports, i.e. javelin, shot put, discus, they're always using one side. 
okay, javelin throwers use their left arm, that's, or they use their right arm, and that's all they do over and over and over. And they can develop very, uh, very clearly um, uh, develop muscle imbalances through the course of the year. So we, we, try, to, we try to offset and um, deal with those muscle imbalances. And this is one of the ways that you can test to see. So it's, um, it's a really important test if you, um, if you're, especially if you're dealing with, with athletes, but this is one way to test, um, you know, uh, trunk, trunk endurance, anterior, lateral, and of course the, the um, posterior extension. Now there are, now you got flexibility assessments and these flexibility assessments um, are going to give you a clue in to, um, you know, how well an individual is able to, is able to move their joints through ranges of motion. There are ideal ranges of motion and uh, you're probably going to see some of the, the more common um, issues and problems associated with um, lack of activity and uh, maybe even maybe even um, injury. So flexibility assessments, for instance, as you look on these two pages, 424, 21, and then 422, um, you can now look at your tables and those are gonna give you the average range of motions for healthy adults. Um, and that's going to help you now to understand a little bit more about some of these actual tests. The first one being the Thomas test for hip flexor length. Um, again, some of these tests you're going to have to just practice and get good at. The uh, Thomas test is basically a way to assess um, the overall flexibility of hip flexors. But what you're able to do is actually um, uh, determine whether whether it's going to be uh, hip, fl hip flexors related to the rectus femoris versus those hip flexors that are intrinsic to the pelvis itself, like the um, iliopsoas muscles. And so that's really what you're doing with the Thomas test. It's basically telling you, are your quads, i.e. rectus femoris, are they overly tight? And you're gonna know that because when you conduct the test, if the knee flexion of uh, knee flexion angle starts to uh, increase. In other words, they can't bring their foot down while they let the knee down. That tells you something about the overall tightness of the rectus femoris. If they can do that, but they can't let their knee down, then what you're looking at probably is a tight iliopsoas and other, other hip flexors at that point. But that's what the Thomas test is designed to do. Very helpful. You got to do it on both sides. And you'll, you'll probably notice a difference between the two, if you are a physical therapist, for instance, this is really where this comes from. Um, they will use, they will actually use goniometers, which are angle testing devices to actually look. And, and as the individual uh, does the movement and they get to a certain point and they stop, they're able to literally measure the angle between the, the torso and the, and the thigh, the upper leg. And they can look at that angle and they write that down. And we're looking for, you know, as time goes on and therapy, continues. Now, trainers, you can do the same. You could do the same thing. Um, but again, normally what we're doing is we're just checking um, checking to see whether or not the client is actually able to get into a certain position. If not, we write that down. Um, and that's the interpretation of the Thomas test on um, 425. We have the passive leg, ray, uh, leg raise, straight leg raise, Test, and this is basically designed to show you um, the overall lengthening capacity of the hamstrings. So it's done one leg at a time, and you can see on page 426 what the actual procedure looks like. Again, these things take practice because you get, you're not just going to lift a person's leg up because if the pelvis is allowed to move, you're going to get an incorrect, you're going to get an incorrect um, assessment. Remember, the leg is attached to the pelvis, and the pelvis can can tilt. One of the ways you know that the pelvis is tilting posteriorly is if you put your hand underneath a person's back, right where the arch of the back is, put your hand underneath there. As soon as you feel the lumbar start to touch your hand, that means that the pelvis is twisting back. It's, it's rotating back. Well, we don't want that. We want, we want the test to be just at the femur where the femur, right, moves in the pelvis itself. We don't want the pelvis to move because we're going to get an inaccurate assessment, right? So the hamstrings will will lengthen to a certain length and that's it. If, there, if, 
if the pelvis moves, you can see that the pelvis will allow for additional movement of the leg and you'll get an incorrect reading. And we don't want that. We do it both legs and then you can interpret it from there. Shoulder flexion and extension. Again, these are not difficult tests to conduct. Uh, they're not difficult to assess. It's just, they take some practice to look at the particulars and you wanna make sure that people are not arching and doing all these extraneous movements at the torso that will distort the actual reading. Because we really wanna know if, if an individual has, has a flexibility issues at the shoulder. And we don't wanna get an incorrect, uh, incorrect sort of um, um, assessment. Um, that takes care of those, of those uh, functional assessments. Movement assessments now, um, are going to, again, we're, we're in a position here where we want to explain to our clients everything we're going to do, help them out to understand, and then move through, make the assessment, uh, do the actual procedure, move through the assessment, and then mark down what it is uh, you noted. So movement training. Um, the goal here is to understand, and I'm just kind of looking through the planes of motion, the three planes of motions, the ability of the body to move effectively and efficiently through these, um, through the three planes of motion, sagittal, frontal, transverse, uh, to perform what are known as the five primary movement patterns. And those are bend and lift, single leg, pushing, pulling, and rotational. So if you think about the five major movements that your body can do, normally we squat down, we, we, um, we get back up, right? Bend and lift. We can do it on one leg. Not that I ever really do that myself, but you can, it's a good, good way to test uh, balance, things like that, right? Pushing, pushing and pulling a broad major movements and then rotational movements like reaching down, reaching up and over all of those. So those are the five main movement patterns. Um, and you have an assessment basically um, for each of those, the bend and lift assessment, that would be the squat. One of the things that you're um, that you're looking uh, when you're doing this is that you're going to have your client do this, you know, five repetitions is the recommendation, and you're basically having to do it smooth, slow, and controlled. You watch them from the side, um, and you got to watch them from the front, and you're looking for those different areas. Remember, remember in the beginning we we talked about um, uh, the foot, the ankle, the knee, the hip, the pelvis, the shoulders, and the head basically the head and the neck area. Those are the things you're looking at now when you do when you do this assessment. You're gonna look at this individual from the side. Now this is the, this is the bend and lift. It's basically a squat with the arms down at your sides. So if you look at the side view table uh, and then the front view, you can make certain assessments and, and interpret from what you see. You know, if the, if the feet are everting just as a, for instance, that tells you something about the relative flexibility of the ankle or the gastroc, right? The calf muscle. Um, if they lean forward or they lean back or they lean way forward, if their arms can't maintain position, if their head can't, all of these things tell you something about possible muscle, muscle imbalances. And then uh, table 1016 gives you, uh, basically gives you the, um, the compilation of all of this information. Just keep in mind um, that these columns are really important. Look at look at over to the right. Key suspected compensations overactive. Remember, when you look at a static postural assessment, um, you know you're not really finding out a whole lot about uh, about. I mean, you are this tight, and there's you know maybe hypertonic. But now, when you do dynamic testing, when you actually have a person moving, now you see where the true overactive, underactive muscles come into play. Because in the static posture, those muscles may not display themselves as either overactive or underactive. Now, other muscles, of course, uh, will show you that. But once you get into the movement assessments, that's when you can really, that's when you can really look and go, ah, the soleus um, and the lateral gastroc um, and the peroneus muscles, um, um, the perineals are overactive or underactive, whatever the case may be. And, um, and then of course those muscles, see, this is where your anatomy comes in. You can, you know, if you have suspected overactive muscles, 
what's going to be the underactive muscles. It's the antagonists of those muscles. So you would, if you knew your anatomy and basic kinesiology, you would know that if the gastroc is overactive, then those muscles in the front of the, of the, um, that anterior compartment of the lower leg are going to be the underactive, something like that. And that's one of the ways you can, you can memorize. And so that's what table 1016, the bend and lift assessment is, um, is going to basically be summarized right there for you. Now, um, you can read the expand your knowledge. It's actually, it's actually pretty interesting. And for those of you that have been in the game for a little bit, one of the things we always, we always talked about was, you know, the whole knee moving forward from the toe. It's like this, you know, the, the, um, uh, you know, the worst thing you could do when you're doing a squat is let the knees roll over. We never, never worried about that because in powerlifting, we knew for, mo for the most part, the average person's knees are going to ride over the toes a little bit. So that was never an issue, but it's was, you know, it's still something that you see in the, in the, um, in the fitness industry. It's basically incorrect. Um, it's actually potentially dangerous on the knee if you don't let that knee ride forward a little bit, but that's also based on, on uh, the actual uh, uh, biometrics that you're dealing with or the biological components of, of, a, of an individual, right? The length of their femur versus the length of their uh, tibia fibula complex, right? So those uh, biological genetic issues that we deal with are going, to, are going to determine a lot about it. So we gotta be very careful when we say to somebody, oh, by the way, don't let your knee come over your toe. No, that might actually be really bad for that person, um, depending on the length of the femur with respect to their to be a fibula plus the plus the flexibility that they may or may not have at the ankle. You can see there's a lot a lot to it. So, um, but again, that's a that's by the way, expand your knowledge boxes are not something that you necessarily have to read through these through these chapters. But here's a case where it's actually pretty interesting. Single leg assessment is the step up. Again, you're doing multiple you're doing multiple repetitions. Um, so that you can look at specific areas on one rep. And then when they do it again, you would be looking at another area. Um, again, you're looking at them from the, uh, from the front um, and from the side, because you simply can't see certain things uh, when you just look at somebody from the front and you can't see some certain things when you look at them from the side. So you're having them do multiple, uh, multiple repetitions so you can see them as they're doing it. Table 1017, there is your summary for the single leg. Pushing and pulling assessments. Again, um, as you go through these, remember the key here is um, understanding and interpreting the results of the test, but for sure know, know how you're going to explain it to your client and what the, you know, what the instructions are. Um, 1016, of course, or 1018 is going to give you the, um, the summary for the uh, push assessment, shoulder push stabilization, pull assessment is the standing standing row. Obviously, you got to have the equipment. Now, technically, you could use a band for this if you needed to put the band at basically shoulder level, and you'd be able to you'd be able to pull it because all you're looking for you're not worried about the resistance application. You're just seeing how the body responds to the pulling. Are they lifting the shoulder girdle? Are they letting their head come forward? How are they doing that? And that's what you're that's what you're looking here. So um, pulling assessment, again, 1019. And then the rotational, <clears throat> rotational assessment. Again, you're, um, you're basically looking now to, to see if there's any deviation um, in the shoulder girdle, lifting of the hip while they're doing that. Some of the things that you would, you would be, um, you'd be looking for when you do the rotational assessment or thoracic spine mobility. And uh, again, you know, the idea is to, you'd be surprised if you don't explain some of these, if you don't explain some of the ways to your clients, they'll literally be sitting there and trying to twist and do all these things to, um, to do the movement and they may do it incorrectly. You gotta be very, very careful, very careful that you explain the proper technique to your client um, as, you're, as you're doing these. So again, up 1020 is your, is your assessment. Um, mover method on page 440, 441. Again, I would definitely read through that so you understand the ABC approach. 
to discussing uh, discussing these uh, these elements with your with your client. And then finally, we had those those assessments um, that are related to load and speed, the load and speed part of the IFT model, and and uh, those assessments again. I'm not saying you're doing these with all of your clients. You may move into some of them with some with some of your clients, and you may never do any of them with your clients. So just you know, just keep that in mind. The goal here is to look for muscular endurance, muscular strength, and power. So um, muscular endurance assessment would be the push-up assessment for upper body, right? And there are ways to do this, and you as the you as a trainer, explain it real well to them, um, and make sure they're doing their technique. Properly, one of the problems you can face when you do these type of assessments, because you're normally dealing with individuals that are a little bit more in shape, a little bit stronger, is you're going to be dealing with, um, you know, maybe <clears throat> incorrect form and technique as they try and do, you know, as many push-ups as they can. So, um, just remember how you terminate the exercise as well. If their knees drop to the ground or whatever the case is. Um, and then, of course, table 1021 gives you the conversion for the push-up score. Body weight squat assessment. Just keep in mind, there's muscular endurance and there's muscular strength. We normally use the push-up as the endurance test because, you know, it's based on the individual. And we, um, we just find it easier to deal with body weight as a way to keep assessing endurance over time versus using the bench press, which we're going to look at in a second here, as the bench press, which is a strength assessment. So <clears throat> push-up assessment for endurance and the uh, body weight squat assessment for lower body endurance. So you can see there's upper body, there's lower body, right? Pretty, pretty intuitive. Upper body, lower body testing. Endurance testing, strength testing. So um, single leg squat, Again, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary from a training perspective. Again, make sure that you are explaining fully to your client, and that's what that's what you would be looking at and reading through here on these on these bullet points. So there are the norms for body weight squats, for instance, on table ten twenty two. Now we move into muscular strength assessments, and um, you know the first one that we normally look at is is the upper body strength assessment, which is the bench press, right? Bench press. Just keep in mind, come right down to the bottom of page 447 and stop right there on that little gray box and read this before you do anything else. Um, when you conduct these tests, it's uh, not necessary for most clients as a starting point for baseline, okay? Uh, at the end of the day, you might never do this with a client ever. It's just not necessary what's the point? Um, but you will do it probably with, with um, athletic clients or individuals that are in pretty decent condition that aren't even athletes. So the one rep bench press assessment, um, again, look, I, I think it goes without saying when you're doing, uh, when you're doing really weighted overloaded type of, of um, testing assessments or any type of resistance training that involves a fair amount of weight, which is what you're dealing with here. You gotta be really, really careful. Uh, make sure your spotting techniques are on point and um, your client doesn't have any, any sort of physical issues, physiological issues, joint issues, things like that, that would, that would tell you this is not a good idea to do this. And so you can do your uh, bench press, of course, um, upper body strength for men and women. And there's um, a fair amount of information here that you can look at. Now, expand your knowledge gives you some considerations for spotting, not a bad idea if you're not familiar with that. The one rep, now we're looking at lower body, right? Strength, which is the one rep squat assessment. And so now again, same thing, you're basically going to be looking to um, ensure that your client is doing the technique properly, smooth, slow, and controlled. And, um, and so now you can do submaximal strength assessments. And basically, if you don't want to do a true one rep max, you can do what's called a submaximal test, meaning you're using significantly less weight for more repetition. So instead of using, for instance, um, and we'll just take table uh, 1025, uh, if you can bench press 300 pounds, 
for one rep, you know, I, I guess we can do that, but doing a single rep with that amount of weight is a lot. Now take the average person that can maybe bench press a hundred pounds max. Is it really a good idea to do that? I don't know. I'd rather from a safety perspective, I'd rather have you do 50 pounds or 60 pounds and see how many reps you can do with that. How accurate is it? It's, you know, not as accurate as doing the one rep max. The idea is that when you get to this point, you read through this, just understand it's just a way, it's a way to gauge, um, to gauge how a person is progressing without putting them under the extreme demands that we see um, with a one rep max test, okay? So if you can do 10 reps, you know, that's probably 75%. That's what this is telling you. Just saying, um, be careful when you do this with, uh, with the average clients. Um, now table 1026 gives you some important information on strength ratios at the shoulder joint, um, in particular, uh, elbow, lumbar spine and hip. It's a good idea to kind of get an idea of what those strength ratios should be ideally. Um, so those are your strength, subactimal strength assessments. Now we get into kind of the, you know, the ultimate way of assessing an individual with your power assessments. Remember power is the total amount of work that is, that is produced over time um, and power force velocity or work over time. If you want to look at it like that. So how much you actually did right weight repetitions over time. Normally the way we do it um, from a testing perspective is we look at a one rep max and the idea if you want to do a one rep max is to look at how fast it took you or how quickly you were able to perform that movement. Now we look at, for instance, Olympic lifters who do the clean and jerk and the, and the, um, the snatch, right? Which is that movement straight up. You see them in the Olympics, right? These guys that are lifting these massive weights overhead. Um, those are power. Those are power movements. Ironically enough, they call them Olympic weightlifters. Yes, but they're actually, they're actually power uh, power athletes, power lifters, you know, bench, bench squat and deadlift are really strength lifters, strength athletes versus Olympic weightlifters who are actually power athletes, because the goal is to move the weight from the ground overhead as fast as you can. That's really the idea and using as much power output as possible in the shortest period of time for a single repetition. So your power assessments are normally conducted Again, look at that gray box, stop, look at the gray box. Uh, because these assessments are intended for athletes and those interested in advanced forms of training, blah, blah, blah. Don't do this with anybody else. <laughs> if you're gonna sell them, do these with anybody, be honest with you, but you wanna make sure that they are athletic or in, or in decent condition, okay? The vertical jump is your first one, vertical jump assessment. There's your information, those are your norms. There's the speed, agility, or the SAQ assessment. It's the T-test. Look at page um, 459. If you, if you wanna set that up and use that and you have athletes, it's, it's, um, it's a good test to do because it's going to assess you know, multi-directional movement, speed, quickness, agility, things like that. The ability to change direction, the, the ability to move speedily from one position to the next. And that's what SAQ is, speed, agility, and quickness. It's kind of the standard way to do it. Now, there are, there are other tests that you can do, but this is the one that, um, that ACE recommends. And if you can get this set up in your, in your gym or outside, absolutely. Just make sure, one of the things you got to keep in mind is that um, when they give you these distances, to put the cones, things like that, you got to follow those guidelines because that's what your assessment um, interpretations are based on, okay? They're, they're based on standardized distances. So for instance, um, it's 10 yards from, from point A to point B. Don't just throw it anywhere you want. It's 10 yards because that speed calculation, that's what is, that's what's used consistently for this particular, for this particular test. And um, yeah, then, you, then you're moving on to um, the end of the chapter. That's right. So expand your knowledge, apply what you know. 
some really good information, by the way, as you get to the end of as you get to the end of the chapter. It's a long, it's a long chapter. It's assessments. It's really, really important. And just keep in mind, like I said, write down the three, the three assessment, um, general assessments that you're going to be doing, right? The functional and all the way to the speed power. And make sure you know each one. Use a separate sheet of paper. Again, as you get further and further through the textbook, there's more and more information because ACE is building you up to understand how to actually incorporate all this into, into a workout for your client. So remember, review, go back and forth, read, rewrite it over and over, and uh, try and see how it uh, works functionally in your everyday life, because that's really what a lot of this is, a lot of this is um, doing. It's helping you um, to realize that once you pass the test, you can go back to and start using it and with your clients, if that's what you decide to do. Again, great chapter. I will see you again now in chapter 11.